Welcome to the Spirit Life Church Milwaukee weekly message. This is Pastor Tom Wilkie, and on behalf of Pastor Lori and all of our church family, we love you and are praying for you. We pray that through this message, your life will grow closer to God and become more like Jesus. We encourage you to open up your heart now to be transformed as you hear God's word and become all he has called you to be. And now, here is Pastor Laurel Wilkie with today's message. But yes, yeah, so I'm continuing my series today on the anointing. And I'm going to share with you some, some other things that are really important. As I've shared with you previously about the anointing, we've talked about various hindrances to the anointing. But likewise, just as there are hindrances, there are certain characteristics that act as conductors of the anointing, if you want to put it that way, kind of like a landing strip. <laughs> to show forth this point, I want to take us to an Old Testament example, all right? And let's just start off in Genesis 24, 1 through 6, and it'll be up for us to look at on the screen. But it's an Old Testament example that I think is very relevant for us today. Let's take a look at it. Now, Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, Please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife from my son, from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell." But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. And the servant said to him, Perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? But Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. So what's happening here? You, you know, this kind of jumped right in to something that was like, well, what's happening here? Is like they're, there's Abraham and the servant. They're talking about Isaac. Well, obviously, most of us all know about Abraham, and he had a, a son in his old age named Isaac, and it was his only son with Sarah. And it was very important because God had said that of Isaac, he was the, the son of promise. He was the one that would carry out that lineage and and God had made that promise to Abraham of of the your your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars of heaven and not only was that literal as far as the Jewish nation but even symbolically prophetically God was speaking of how all of us are descendants of Abraham because we are of the faith of Abraham so this was a very special thing and Isaac was a very special person and God, or, 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 and God had revealed, obviously, to Abraham that the wife that Isaac was going to have would be very important, all right? So Abraham goes, I need to entrust this task of finding a wife for my son to somebody I trust very much, and that was his servant Eleazar. That was the, the servant's name, Eleazar. And so he says, I want you to go back to where my relatives lived, because he was living in a very foreign land with this people called the Canaanites who worshipped idols. And he goes, I don't want my son to marry someone who is worshipping idols because then he might not worship God because his wife might turn him away. So he goes, Eliezer, go back to my family country and find someone there, a, w- a woman for my son there. And so that's what's happening here. And Abraham was responsible for seeking a wife for his son Isaac. So now, just as Abraham, this is so cool, just as Abraham sought a bride for his son Isaac, in this day, our Father God is seeking a bride for his son Jesus. Now the Father has sent, this is so cool how God just takes stuff in the Old Testament and uses it for us now. Just like the Father uh, you know, the, the father Abraham sent Eliezer, his servant. The father God has now sent his helper, the Holy Spirit, to the earth to find a bride for his son, to seek and to save that anointed bride. And that bride is you, all right, if you choose to be that way. Now, this bride will have 
three characteristics evidenced further here in Genesis 24. And that's what I'm really going to share with you here in the, shouldn't be too long, but I'm going to help us all see this today. And let's continue in Genesis 24 and verse, starting in verse 9. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham. This was kind of a, a, a sign that he was really serious back then. It was, it was kind of a tradition. He was like, I'm, gonna, I'm making a promise to you here. So under the thigh of, his, of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, for all his master's goods were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. And then he said, this is Eliezer praying here, he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, here I stand by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink, and I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. And verse 15 says, and it happened before he had finished speaking that behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. Now we're going to continue reading, but let's stop here and talk about this. So, Because the first characteristic we see God will be looking, God is looking for, is for someone to be willing. All right? God's bride will be a willing vessel. The Holy Spirit always gives people a choice. He extends the invitation, saying, I have need of you. You know, will you come and be what I desire you to be? He always gives you a choice. Now, the bride has the privilege of choosing how to respond. It's a very beautiful thing. Rebecca came to the well with a pitcher on her shoulder, all right, ready to work. She was, she was going there to do a task. She was going to draw water for her family. Now, it's, it's so cool because just like that, God desires that we come every day to his throne with a pitcher, so to speak, ready to work. Now, this doesn't mean that, you know, we are trying to work for our salvation or that we're doing things out of our own strength or ability, but this is about our willingness to God. This is really what that symbolizes. It's our part to be willing to do anything he wants us to do. And this is so wonderful because God will never ask you to do anything that's too difficult for his grace is always sufficient for you. Now, God has often asked me to do things that I felt very, like, insecure or unstable or ill-equipped or just, you know, even things that were like, I don't really know if I want to do that. <laughs> and, but it's, it's wonderful because I've found that the power and ability to do those things God's asking me to do, that power doesn't often come until you actually make the choice to go do it. <laughs> Some people think, well, you know, I'm going to wait till I feel like, I'm going to wait till I feel it, (laughs) and then I'll go do it. And God's like, "Mm, no, go choose to do it, and then I'll make you feel it. (laughs) At least that's how it works for me in my life a lot of times. God, because God wants to see, just like Abraham had to do when he sacrificed Isaac, are you willing to put that on the altar and raise the knife, and, and Abraham was going to do it, because the Bible says that he was going to do it. He wasn't like, uh, I don't know. I mean, he was, this was as good as done for Abraham. Abraham's like, this is, I'm going to obey God here. And, but then the grace came upon Abraham that literally he was able to then have his son in a way resurrected. That's what Hebrews talks about. His, Isaac was, in a sense, resurrected to Abraham. And, but that grace came to Abraham when he obeyed. Same for us. And, it, you know, it's, it's, it's great, you know, when the power comes ahead of time, but it often comes after you make that sacrifice in the flesh to be obedient, even when you don't want to or feel like it's, you know, even if you feel like it's too difficult. But this is wonderful because Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So God's way can be easy because 
when he asks you to do a certain thing, it always produces fruit, ability, and the anointing. It's so powerful. I mean, and I've lived this, and I've seen my, my family live this, that it's like once you step out and go, God, I am maybe tired, or I don't feel emotionally equipped to do this, I'm going to just say yes. I just say yes. I just, it's like a, a kind of a quote that I have in my life, like just, just say yes, Lord, just yes. I just say yes. Like, no is not an answer to you, God. It's always yes. Like, because I know that when I say yes to all these things, that's like, it, it, that's when the change can come. It always is, again, like I said, the bride always has a choice. But when the bride makes the right choice, that's when God goes, now I can work. All right? So, those, you know, this leads to the second characteristic, all right? Because the first one was to be willing. You got to be willing. But the second characteristic is also important. In Genesis 24, let's continue reading about this in verse 16. Now the young woman was very beautiful to behold, a virgin. No man had known her. And she went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. And the servant, this is Eliezer, ran to meet her and said, Please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. So she said, Drink, my lord. Then she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw, draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. Wow. So when the request for a drink was given, Rebecca immediately complied. All right. Now, <laughs> some people are a little bit like goats. <laughs> goats? What are you talking about? Goats? They always seem to say, but, 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 you know, well, but Lord, I, but Lord, but, you know, because goats are always, you know, headbutting and stuff, you know, but God is looking for sheep <laughs> that just say, yes, Lord. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, I'm making a joke here, but it's, it's, it's an important point. You know, it just, the sheep are always led by the shepherd. Goats like to just kind of, you know, I remember one time, this was like back when I was really young. We were at the petting zoo, you know, at, at the zoo in, here in the city. And, and we were feeding the, I was feeding the goats. And I remember that the goats were so headstrong. They were just like, almost like just go for it. The food I was giving, they were just like, and they were strong. And I was like, I was almost scared of them because they were so fierce. You know, they were just, I'm going to do it. And I'm like, what it now? And, and it's like, and, but sheep are, are tender and they're led by the shepherd. And they're very kind of more peaceful. I mean, they're not always that smart. That's why they need a shepherd. But they're willing to be led, all right? And they're obedient when they're led, all right? So God is looking for sheep, and that's the second characteristic, to be obedient. Because sometimes you can be willing. You're like, well, I'll, you know, I'm willing, but then are you obedient? There's a beautiful scripture in the Old Testament that says, if you're willing and obedient, that you'll eat the good of the land, it's not just obedient, because sometimes you can be obedient and, like, have a bad attitude. <laughs> you got to have a good attitude and be obedient. The willing kind of deals with your attitude. The obedience deals with your action. All right? So willing and obedient. The kingdom of God begins very simply as God's rule and reign in our hearts. It then proceeds to flow out of us as it influences every kingdom that we encounter. And now as Jesus becomes Lord over what we do, say, and think, he blesses everything our hand finds to do because he is in total control over it. Now Jesus preached the kingdom of God. That kingdom is inside of us. It is experienced when Jesus becomes literally more important to us than anything else. Now, you know, if you think about it in, in an example, in say, a marriage, all right, when a man and a woman pledge themselves to each other, they then acquire, you know, the benefits of the other person because of their commitment to one another. So in a similar way, the more obedient we become to Christ's lordship in that covenant marriage relationship, us with Christ, it then enables his victories, all of his benefits, to then become ours. So most of us, though, unfortunately, even myself, we all fall all have probably made this mistake at one point or another, we sometimes do the opposite, meaning that we plan everything and then ask God to just bless what we plan to do. <laughs> and, you know, again, all of us, I think, fall guilty for that at least one time in our life, or if not more. But, but God never really promised to bless your plans or my plans. 
you know, of course you have to make plans. I'm not saying you just sit and go like, I'm never going to plan anything. Well, but in your planning, you have to seek for God's plan. All right? Let him guide and direct you and stay submitted to him. You see that in the life of David. Every time he had to make a decision, it said, David inquired of the Lord. David inquired of the Lord. And, and then God would direct him. And, his direct, and then he was, his life was blessed because he always inquired of the Lord. He didn't just assume that he just knew what God wanted to do all the time. He was like, you know, and even, even one time in, in, when he was doing a situation in battle where God told him to do something once, to go out and attack this way once, he didn't just assume that the next time he had to go to battle that God wanted him to do it the exact same way again. He inquired of the Lord again. Say, Lord, do you want me to do it that same way? And actually God directed him to not do it that same way. And so it was, it was a day, even, a, even in our life, we have to daily inquire of the Lord, saying, Lord, I'm not sure about this today. Please just guide me. And then, and then if, if, this is so beautiful because if you pray that prayer and ask the Lord to guide you, then it opens the ability up for you to be guided by the Spirit. It's so wonderful because we are literally to submit ourselves to God. This is one of the most important keys to overcoming the enemy. In James, it talks about submit to God and then resist the devil. Some people just resist the devil or they just submit to God. It's actually both. In fact, you can't really resist the devil with power unless you're submitted to God first. That's why it's so important. We can resist the devil if we are submitted to God. If we have left him out of God out of our plans, we're kind of at the devil's mercy. But so don't be fearful of submitting everything under the mighty hand of God's authority because when we submit to his authority, we walk in and reflect the authority of God on the earth then. His name literally becomes our name. I mean, and his authority becomes our authority. So sometimes at least to me, maybe some of you may be thinking this, maybe you're not, but I'll I'll share this with you because sometimes, at least to me, submitting something to God, you know, meaning being totally willing to follow his way and not mine, it feels kind of like death. <laughs> I mean, you think, well, why are you laughing? Well, because sometimes it feels like, ouch, like I kind of want to do it my way. And something in me kind of feels like it's dying, <laughs> you know, and it actually is. Your flesh is dying, <laughs> But that's a good thing because that's when your spirit can receive life. And you're out of your spirit, the Bible says out of your, your heart and out of your spirit, man, will flow those rivers of living water. So when you can get your flesh to die, you can experience the true river of God and the Holy Spirit coming out of your heart. It's, like, it's kind of like, like a deadness that produces a resurrection. <laughs> It's like, it's so beautiful. Because in fact, let me follow up on that. In the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul actually wrote some very strong corrective word to the church in Corinth. Some people think, you know, or maybe I should say, some people don't know that the book of 1 Corinthians is actually kind of like a corrective book. I mean, he was writing to the church of Corinth who had a lot of issues. Like, you know, they were doing like, there, just, there was disruption in their church services, and there was sexual immorality, and there was, you know, people were in pride. And so it's a very corrective book, actually. So he had a lot of, he had to help them in a lot of ways. And there were some pretty deep issues that these Christians had to bring correction in their lives with. So then in 2 Corinthians, his follow-up letter, he wrote this, and I want to show this to you. In 2 Corinthians 7, starting verse 8 through 11, Paul says, for though I caused you sorrow by my letter, he's referring to his past one, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. <laughs> for I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not, this is what I want, key phrase here, I want to see, have you see, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what, 
what indignation, what fear, and what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything, you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. Because as we see, and Paul further goes on in the book of 2 Corinthians, he's, it shows that the Corinthians really did repent, and they really did turn away from their sin. And so Paul, notice how Paul said that the things I wrote to you, in, you know, to, to repent of and have godly sorrow about, I did it so that you would not suffer loss. Oftentimes we think that when we surrender something to God or, you know, we're, you know, that we're going to lose something good. But actually the Holy Spirit says, that's not so. You may get the thing, you, know, you, you may not get the thing that you wanted, that you thought you wanted, you know, but you're actually going to get something better. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so beautiful. It's like you think, well, I, I really want that. Well, actually, sometimes the thing that you want God, God knows this, but we don't. It will actually hurt us. And so he goes, no, you actually don't want that. So I'm not going to give you that thing that you wanted or, or allow you to stay in that lifestyle because it's actually going to kill you or someone around you spiritually, physically, emotionally, whatever. And he goes, I, I want to save you from that. Just like the, the Corinthians, God knew Corinthian church, what you're in right now, that's not going to work out. You've got to repent and turn from that because... I have something so much better for you, all right? So it's, sometimes it feels like death, but it's actually a resurrection. God says, you're not going to suffer loss. You think it's going to be lost, but you're not going to suffer the loss. It may feel originally like a loss, but then later on you're going to look back and go, wow, I am so happy. Look what God did because I, I honored him and I followed him. So in Psalm 84, 11, it gives us this promise. Listen to this. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And that's a promise you can stand on. That, God, as I continue to submit myself to you, you said no good thing do you withhold from my life. That as, I'm, as, I, as I make it, my, my one thing, my one goal to walk before you, honoring you, loving you, fellowshipping with you. God, that you provide every good thing in my life. Hallelujah. So if for some reason you don't get what you want, then God knows it must not have been good. Because <laughs> God said no good thing will he withhold. That's so that you can stand on that. And God will always give you what he knows is good if you trust him. And submit yourself to him. And resist the enemy, because that's important too. Now many might agree with this, but what happens when it doesn't happen right away? Or when you think it should happen? Well, this leads to the third and final characteristic. Let's look at this in Genesis 24, uh, in verse 20. Continuing on in this story here. So Rebecca, she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough, ran back to the well to draw water, and drew for all his camels. And the man, wondering at her, remained silent so as to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. So it was when the camels had finished drinking that the man took a golden nose ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrists weighing ten shekels of gold and said, Whose daughter are you? Tell me, please, is there room in your father's house for us to lodge? So she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, Milcah's son, whom she bore to Nahor. Moreover, she said to him, We have both straw and feed enough and room to lodge. Then the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy and his truth toward my master. As for me being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. So the young woman ran and told her mother's household these things. So going back, this text slightly... I want to say romanticizes the act of watering camels, but I'm going to break, bring it down home here today. This was a long and tough job. <laughs> All right, camels can drink an absurd amount of water at, at one time in a single, you know, and, and think about it. She had a single water jar. This was a lot of heavy lifting for this lady. <laughs> I mean, down and up and pour and down and up. And pour. I mean, I don't know how long it took. It could have taken like an hour or maybe longer. I don't know, but it was... You know, she was doing a lot of heavy lifting, literally, literally speaking. And, and notice in this instance, as Rebecca was 
laboring to do all this, you know, the servant Eleazar was just quite a silently watching. Remember who I said Eleazar kind of represents, the Holy Spirit. He was, and, and, and this servant was watching her faithfulness. This is the third characteristic that we must really have etched upon our heart. This servant was watching her going, is she going to do this through? Is she going to finish this task? Is she going to get tired? Is she going to quit? Is she going to just go, oh, sorry, i got to go now. This is getting a little long. You know, is she, is she going to fulfill this to completion? All right? And Rebecca, remember this. She had no promise of any reward or benefit from doing this. She was just doing this simply to be a blessing to this man. She had no, you know, Eliezer hadn't said, oh, well, you know, I'll pay you to water my camels. <laughs> she just offered to do this out of the kindness of her heart. So she didn't, you know, she could have just backed out and said, oh, well, you know, I told you how to do this, but I actually can't now. It's getting a little too difficult. I'm starting to sweat. <laughs> my arms are a little sore. You know, that, Rebecca, she, this was a lady. She did this hard task all on her own, and she was faithful to complete it to the very end. Now, faithfulness may be the most difficult characteristic to develop, especially in our modern day, where I might step on some toes here, but if something's too difficult, we just quit. You know, a job is too hard, we just get a different one. Or we don't like our school, we just transfer. Or someone offends us at church, we just hop over to another one. Or the person we married rubs us the wrong way, we just divorce them and marry somebody else. It just, you know... Unfaithfulness, I will say, it's, it's an unspoken epidemic in our nation, in the world possibly even. And it's costing us very dearly. We don't even realize it, but it's costing us and those around us very, very much. We don't realize that the victory, everyone wants a victory, but they don't want a battle. <laughs> we go, oh, I want the victory. Well, to get a victory, you have to conquer something. You've got to stay put and, and, and fight it out. We don't get the victory if there's not a challenge, all right? It may be easy to be faithful sometimes, maybe once or twice, but what happens when God requires obedience from us as he did from Abraham, waiting patiently for many years for his promise, Isaac, to come? Or like Caleb, even, in the Bible, who had to wait, he had to wait 45 years. You really have for, waiting for something for 45 years. I don't know if, I, I mean, I'm not even 45 years old. <laughs> I can't say I've waited that long for anything. But, I mean, to wait 45 years for your promised land, I mean, and to stay faithful to go, I'm, God, I'm believing. It's coming. It's going to come. And, and, it's, and he, was, he was expectantly, you know, to wait 45 years. We must always be aware of the fact that God is faithful and will keep his promise. So when Abraham's servant showed up that Eliezer at the well that day, we don't know what the rest of the women were thinking, but we do know that Rebecca was thinking about service. Not about promotion, but about how to be about God's work. And remember, I made that little, uh, you know, I, I, I brought the, the, the fact out that as I, I, as I was reading it, it just jumped out at me that Eliezer, the servant, was silently watching <laughs> and it's kind of like, I feel like that's sometimes what it's like with us sometimes with, with God. It's almost kind of God's just kind of like quietly watching, like, you going to be faithful with that? I'm just going to sit here and quietly watch. Hmm. So sometimes it's like, oh, God, I don't hear your voice. Well, he's just quite a quietly watching. Watching, are you faithful? And you go, because, because, but, you, but you can stick it out because you know that God is watching and that he is, how do you say this? He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That he is, he's watching you in love. That he is, he's going, keep going, keep going. Because Proverbs 28, 20 says, a faithful man will abound with blessings. And so God blesses and anoints faithful people. Now, as I close here, there's one last story I want to bring home to you. And that's about a man named Zadok. Now you think, I've never heard of this man. Well, you're going to know today. Zadok was a faithful priest during the time of King Saul and David. Now on three different occasions, he had major decisions to make about following the Lord. Now David and Saul, none of you even know this, they were in mortal combat 
all right, with, you know, literally, well, actually, David wasn't really fighting Saul. Saul was fighting David. But there was this struggle between the two of them. And, you know, and so Zadok was a priest at the time, and he kind of was standing on the sidelines, so to speak, watching this play out. Now, Saul, if you want to kind of be representative here, Saul represents the old order, and David kind of can represent the new order. Saul was proud, and he was a jealous man, given over to rebellion and pride. Even though he was God's anointed, he wasn't always that way, but he had become that way, unfortunately. Now, David was a man after God's own heart, according to the scriptures. He says that. Now, because Saul exalted himself, God eventually took the mantle of kingship from him and gave it to David. Now, again, we're talking about Zadok here. The first decision Zadok had to make was whether to follow the the old order of Saul or the new of David. And that's a choice that we all are faced with today. You think, what do you mean by that? Well, it's will we follow tradition or will we follow the anointing? All right. Will we do things out of pride or, you know, as they've always been done? Well, that's just the way I've always done that. (laughs) Well, or will you be willing and daring to follow something that's kind of maybe new to you, that God is saying, this is what I want you to do. (laughs) Are you willing to do that? God is always moving and doing new things. Now, the paths of our ancestors may have been adequate for them, and it's always important to honor our our elders and and our especially you know our, our ancestors and things like that, but you know the people of the of the past and our, and our forefathers that's a better word for it than maybe ancestors but our forefathers, but even though, though their ways were probably adequate for them, God is always continuing to do new things and revealing new things in His Word to His church. All right, so we must have ears to hear that and not be stiff necked. All right, because in Isaiah 43, 19, it says, Behold, I do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And so Zadok saw the anointing on David, and he chose to follow David rather than to continue with Saul. He chose to literally pay the price for the costly anointing because you think, well, wasn't that a better choice? Well, at the time, if you would have sided with David, you could have been killed by Saul. So this wasn't like a, a better fit for, for Zadok. This was like, I'm going to go with, this was a, a costly thing for Zadok. But he goes, I recognize that God has anointed David. I need to back David right now. All right? So Zadok made that choice. And it was a costly one. But he made it, and it was, a right, it was the right choice. But then he had to encounter another choice. And because later on, Absalom David's third son rebelled and attempted to overthrow his father, who was now King David, because David was now the king. So Zadok actually prayed and asked God to show him which man to back, because, you know, he didn't know. Absalom was coming, you know, trying to be the king, and he goes, well, God, are you trying to raise up Absalom now? What are you doing here? So, because if Absalom were God's man, Zadok was ready to support him. But God showed Zadok, after Zadok prayed about it, God showed Zadok that, Abra, that, that, excuse me, that Absalom was rebellious and told him not to follow him. And so Zadok made a decision that every one of us must make. This is another decision he had to make. Will we support the popularity of a personality or will the principles of God become priority over a man or woman? All right? So just because someone is popular doesn't mean they are God's anointed. Mind blown. <laughs> News flash, all right? Because, you know, Zadok chose principles over personality, and we must do the same. Now, it seems that many seem to err on one side of these choices I talked about. Some people are so afraid of anything new, or they're so opposed to anything different than what, you know, the way they were raised or the way they were taught, or that they are resisting the very God they claim to worship, all right? They're stuck in traditions or habits that even, even if they, you know, they have worked at a time, they're no longer what God says is needed for right now. So Pastor Lori's message last week, as well as the series that my dad has been doing on receiving God's guidance, you can go back and listen to those on our YouTube channel. They're very, very timely words for the, for the world we live in today because whether you mean you, 
I, I'm, when I say this, everyone's, I'm sure, going to agree. The devil is on the move. <laughs> the devil's on the move. The book of Revelation phrases it saying that he's actually filled with rage because he knows his time is short. All right? So this is why we have to have believers who are not stuck in bad habits, dead religion, toxic relationships, or even just wrong mindsets that will keep us from the work that God is doing in the earth and that he wants us to be a part of with him that he wants us to do. So this is like the choice Zadok had to make to leave Saul and to follow David. All right? Not going to be stuck in something that's dead and dry or or that's toxic or not working. I'm going to go on with whatever God wants is leading me into. All right? That was, you know, and on the other side of the spectrum, some people are so into everything that seems flashy or glamorous and exciting and scintillating that they think that the way the Spirit works is always in this way, and they think they need to just move away from what they've been in because it doesn't measure up to something else that they see out there. I know that was a mouthful, but let me, let me make, make this clear. They think it's always about the bigger or the more exciting, the faster results, the incredible things that give you goosebumps. Or I, Absalom was like this. According to 2 Samuel 14, it says that actually there was no one in all Israel that was praised for his good looks like Absalom, all right? And it says literally from the top of his head to the sole of his feet, there was no blemish on him. I'm actually quoting that. And he had this beautiful, apparently this beautiful thick hair that he would just cut like once a year. And they would actually like weigh it as currency. Like this guy was like some stud. I mean, he was just like, he was so, and not just physically attractive, He was so good to all the people, apparently. He treated them with this great understanding, and he loved to listen to them. And so much so that the Bible says he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So this guy was a stud and had a winner personality, but he had a rebellious heart full of self-promotion, according to the Bible. All right? So similarly, some believers spend their whole spiritual life like you know, floating around from like one big meeting to one revival to one big church, you know, almost like they're trying to get this like spiritual fix, okay? They believe that if something's not flashy or special, that it's not God, all right? And I want to disprove, I want to to smash that bug today because <laughs> I, you know, they, they, they think, well, God would never do something small or something humble, But on the contrary, like God called Zadok to stay put with David, even though he wasn't the big, flashy, special Absalom, God says to be faithful even when it's not the most new and exciting thing is very important. God is calling upon his church to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Because just like Zadok, you will be saved from following an Absalom. (laughs) And perishing in Absalom's destruction, those of you who don't know the story, Absalom died a horrible death. His luscious hair got caught in a tree, (laughs) and he died in battle. And it was a horrible downfall. And if Zadok had followed him, he might have been privy to that. But Zadok was smart. He he, he prayed about it. He said, Lord, what do I do? And God said, don't follow that Absalom. Stay put with David. So in a similar way, We have to be that way. We have to realize that God works sometimes not just in the big, but in the humble. He works in the still, small voice. God might be calling you to a very humble task today, maybe just to help your family or to help a neighbor or to do something kind of that's kind of unpleasant or difficult on your job. And God's just as in that as he is on the the big mountain and the lightning and the thunder. God's in the small too, folks. <laughs> and you can't forget that. And that was what I was trying to bring home to you about this. We can't just back out of something because it doesn't give you goosebumps or it doesn't make you feel all tingly inside. That's where the power comes to be able to overcome and to stay faithful, even in the things that are difficult. Now, the final task, or excuse me, test for Zadok came when David had grown old. Adonijah, another one of David's sons, rose up and tried to take his father's throne by force. Seems like it's a, <laughs> a repeated thing that keeps happening here. Now, allegiance to Adonijah might have actually meant instant promotion for Zadok the priest. But when Zadok prayed about the matter, however, God told him, God, I haven't 
chosen Adonijah and that he should remain faithful to David. And so Zadok obeyed and, and literally waited on a possible promotion in his own ministry. And because he remained faithful to the Lord and David, the Lord's chosen, God actually promoted Zadok. This is beautiful. Because when Adonijah's flame died out <laughs> just as quickly as it had arisen, the two faithful friends, David and Zadok, they remained together side by side, hand in hand. And as David lay dying years later, he actually spoke this to, to Zadok, his friend. He said, Zadok, you will be the high priest in Solomon's administration. And he was actually serving Zadok the priest was serving as high priest when it's recorded that the, that the glory of the Lord filled the temple and the priest couldn't stand in ministry. He was the high priest then. He had passed all of these tests one by one by one. And Zadok, he, you know, he went, went Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you. I'm going to remain faithful. I'm not going to try to exalt my own ministry here. I'm just going to just be faithful. And because of those Humble choices. He was the high priest when the cloud came in. And, 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 and Solomon's, actually, Solomon's, the, the temple of Solomon and the, the kingship of Solomon was the greatest kingship literally at, in, as far as the, the, the wealth and the magnitude and the influence of all the kings. And he got to be a part of that. Because, because did it happen right away? No, it took a long time. But he was able to be a part of that because his faithfulness was rewarded. Now, faithfulness is a test we all face regularly. You'll probably face it today, tomorrow, a year from now. All of your life you'll be faced with that. Will you re remain faithful to God? Will you remain faithful in waiting on the Lord's timing in, your, in, in, in receiving those things that you're believing for? Or will you give way to pride or unbelief or fill in the blank, whatever. But God is giving you the opportunity today to have, a, to have a new heart, to be faithful. Zadok chose to wait upon God for promotion and not secure it by the arm of the flesh. And he was rewarded for that. Now, And even Esther was chosen because of her faithfulness. When her people were in danger, she, she could have looked to the good of her own position and forgotten about them. But she chose not to do that. Even if it costed her her life, she was faithful to fulfill what God had asked her to do. And God knew David would be a good king because he had been a faithful shepherd to watch some sheep out in the field. He was faithful to do that. God said, okay, I'll use you as king because you did that. Now God knew that he would be a, a, a good king because of that. And even Joseph was faithful in slavery and an, and an imprisonment. God knew he could, Joseph would, could be trusted with authority as second in command of Egypt because he had seen the faithfulness Joseph had kept steadfast to him, even in all those times where it was horrible and he was experiencing horrible experiences. And even in the book of Acts, there was this wonderful story about... Um, the apostles, when, when the apostles had to choose, and actually the, well, it was God helping the apostles to choose someone to replace Judas Iscariot, who had betrayed the Lord, they, they needed a new man to fill his place. And they went, God, who do we choose? You know, who do we choose to be one of the 12 apostles here? You know, literally, it's so beautiful. The only characteristic that the Holy Spirit instructed to, as far as all the men to choose the only special characteristic was they needed to find someone who had been there from the beginning of Jesus' ministry all the way to the end. They chose a man named Matthias because he had just always been there. <laughs> I mean, literally, that, that was the only criteria. We just need a guy that's been there from the start of it to the finish of it. I mean, there was nothing else listed about Matthias as being special, just that and he was chosen as to fill the place in, in, in the void of all the 12 apostles. Matthias, you've just, you just stuck around. You've just been faithful. Now you get to be one of the 12 apostles. I mean, this guy didn't say he had a great teaching gift. Not saying he didn't have that. He didn't do, you know, not saying he didn't have other gifts, but it wasn't recorded. What was recorded was that he had just been there the whole time. 
he had just been faithful, even if it wasn't, you know, big, even if he wasn't in a big or spectacular place. He had just, he, he, even if he was just stuck in the background, God said, I need Matthias to be one of the 12 apostles because he's always been there for me. So God is looking for faithful people. And I encourage you today, as I close here, like Rebecca, keep watering those camels. <laughs> like Joseph, keep believing. Even in your, maybe if you're in a, look, it looks like a prison dungeon, or, or you're in kind of a place of an unenjoyable environment, just stay faithful. Be the, be the one that when God has need of someone, like Matthias, he could look and go, yeah, I know them. They're always there. there. You'll be ready to receive your assignment. He'll extend to you that right arm of, of power in his costly anointing. Be prepared to receive it, for it awaits all those who are dedicated to faithfulness. He is calling today a faithful bride, and he calls you his faithful bride. He really does. So let's pray about that today. I want to I wanna release the peace of God, the strength of God for faithfulness today. Because as I said, it's something that you just don't see very much anymore. And my heart grieves for that. Where is the perseverance? Where is the steadfastness? Even in just in our relationship with God, we can't grow weary. The Bible says, do not grow weary in doing good. For at the proper time, you will reap if you faint not. That's the word I really strongly believe that God wants to speak to his church today. Don't faint. Don't faint. Just keep going. Just keep strong. I'm with you. Just like that servant just stood almost silently watching Rebecca pour the water. God's going, will you keep it up? I'm with you watching. The Bible actually says that when the Lord comes back, he says, my reward is with me. God's not unjust to forget your work and labor of love. And even, not just the reward, you get to receive Christ as your bridegroom. You get to have him go, I saw your love for me in what you did. I saw your love for me in how you served that person on your job. I saw how you loved your kids. I saw how you were faithful to the church of God and the house of God, to your fellow church members. I saw how you were faithful in your in your time in the word with me in prayer. I saw how you prayed for that person. I saw how you gave of your finances to the, to the, uh, to the ministry or to people who needed uh, finances. I saw how you spoke those words of encouragement even when you were discouraged. God's going, I saw all those things. I didn't miss it. I was watching and you were faithful. So let's pray today. I know it's, it's, it's easier said than done. I experience weariness too, but God says, come to me, those who are weary, and I will give you rest. Receive your rest in, in God. It's the Sabbath rest so that as you rest in the Lord, you can then be faithful. Let's close our eyes. Let's ask God. It only comes from the grace of God. It only comes from the grace of God, that Holy Spirit's power. God, we need your power for faithfulness. In, in a day and time when the world around us is faltering, when even fellow believers or Christians, their faith is waning or they're giving way to any work of darkness, God, we want to be your burning and shining lamps that burn brightly and don't, don't smolder out. God, we want to be those, that faithful bride to you that serves you. Just that we are willing, first of all, to do whatever you ask us to do, and that we are then obedient to do it, and that, Lord, we stay faithful in our obedience. God, help us with this. We need you, Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. Come upon us in a greater way this day. Oh, Jesus, increase that anointing. Lord, we ask for the increase, the increase of that ability, God from your spirit as we just say yes to you. Lord, it's not about our own willpower or strength, God. We just simply say yes, and we trust that as we say yes, that you will give us the ability to obey. We just simply say yes, we trust you, Lord. We trust that you are good. We trust that you bless us with everything that is good. 
that your heart toward us is faithful and that you are so kind, Lord. You are so kind. Thank you for your kindness, Lord, that leads us to repentance in you. God, we believe and trust you this day. And I just release joy to you today. The joy of the Lord is your strength today. That in everything you do this week, as you go to your work, as you're with your kids, as you're with your family, as you're with your neighbors, as you're with fellow church members, that you will have the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord over you, his joy about you, that he's so happy about you, that it gives you the strength to obey him and to love one another this day. Lord, thank you.